Yeah. Intensive care is under pressure like never before. After Christmas, it just sort of hit me. I've seen a couple of people within the short time that I spent in a hospital, they didn't make it. From a relentless rise in COVID admissions. That's how long can you keep going like this? At this pace, I think we've got about a week. Staff fear burnout. I'm here. Okay. The nurses are, are, are broken. The physical and mental load is, is huge. The toll is immense. But my emotions are all over the place. Scared, sad, petrified, worried. This should be an operating theatre, but there's no surgery here. Instead, it's being converted into an intensive care unit. The number of COVID patients in London's hospitals has doubled in just two weeks. They're more stretched now than at the peak last April. We've got three times as many critically ill patients in this hospital than we normally have and we've managed to stretch and spread to cover that but that can't go on forever. Intensive care is expanding across University College Hospital, a children's area now for desperately sick adults. Every day more wards are being transformed into ICU ready for the next influx but senior staff are worried. I've um, got you know, plans that we can expand for another week at this rate, but we, after that we really need to slow, see it slow down or, or we're going to see um, the care we, we can deliver suffer, I think. We'd be running so thin on staff that we wouldn't, you just physically couldn't look after critically ill patients. One, two, three, four, five, six. It would be ideal if we had one more person. The ventilated patients are turned twice a day. Lying on their front, prone, helps get oxygen to their lungs. Nine staff are involved in this delicate procedure. Okay, okay. okay we're going to go all over on three. One, two, three. Okay. To ensure breathing tubes, drug lines, all the paraphernalia of critical care are not disturbed. COVID has made this a winter like no other. Attila is 67. Over the holidays, coronavirus spread through his family. After Christmas, it just sort of hit me. He just sort of went bang. I just couldn't breathe uh, uh, at all. I didn't think I'd actually uh, make it through. And you're gasping. It's like, you know, uh, there, there is no oxygen around. And frightening. Really... Sorry? Frightening. Very, very frightening. Very. There are three pregnant women in intensive care. Rachel is due in five weeks. But every mother put her child before herself. Both she and her baby are doing well. They can't do anything that will harm the baby, obviously, and they look after my baby so well. All the time coming and checking, monitoring, the baby is happy. You can't see, but they're looking after two people. Yeah. In one. They're saving life. With the The demands on staff are unrelenting. And on their families too. Alice has young children cared for by grandparents in Scotland during the first peak. In stage one, I sent my five and seven year old daughters uh, away because we weren't quite sure how we how we would manage. Um, so I had my five year old in, in tears last night at the thought of another lockdown because she thought that meant I was sending her away again. She's most worried about the impact on nurses, the bedrock of care in ICU. It's not uncommon at the moment that I, I've come to work, I've walked into the unit to find nurses uh, crying. The, the physical and mental load is, is huge and I'm really worried that um, we're going to break a lot of nurses. Um, and what about and, the doctors and as doctors, well? <laughs> and doctors too. Intensive care nursing is highly specialised. Usually they're one-to-one -one with patients, now responsible for three, four or five, with other staff filling the gaps. We're so stressed we have to prioritise, and prioritising care is not what the NHS that I grew up in. We shouldn't have to choose which patient gets what care first. Ashley says 
She's never had to make decisions like this before. If people asking for your help, you just don't know who to help first. The patients are losing their lives at, at a dramatic speed. We're not just getting old people. This is young people that we're getting, people my age. That's okay. I've reported from here several times during the pandemic, and I'm always struck by the professionalism and dedication of staff. But this is a system under strain like never before. The warning signs here couldn't be clearer. The NHS is now on the brink. Unless infection rates start to fall soon, then it could seriously impact patient care, and not just for those with COVID. So these are really serious um, consequences, and if we get to that point, we can't offer anyone ITU, not just COVID patients, but you know anyone who, who has a traffic accident or a heart attack or a stroke or whatever it is, we just won't have the, any more capacity to take, to take them in. For now, the trust is coping. Cancer operations are continuing, though most non-urgent surgery is cancelled. All of a sudden, out of the blue, you know, just COVID just like knocked on the door, and there you go. Hello, gents. Yeah, I'm just pleased that I'm still alive now. Gerald is awaiting chemotherapy for lung cancer and had been shielding, but still caught coronavirus. Okay. All right then, Dad. Love you lots. All right, love you. Love you. He just wants to get home to his daughters. When you've got young ones behind, you know, that's your worry. You know, because you, you fight for your life is for them. And, you know, you want to give them a life. The next few weeks could be the biggest challenge the NHS has faced in its history and it will be its staff who will bear the brunt for all of us.